On a relative basis, Japan's debt to GDP is 270% and growing. On a relative basis, our debt to GDP is half of that. We are the most important economic force in the world. It is going to continue to be the most economic force in the world. And all I see actually on every single monetary basis is every other country struggling more than we are. So my question to all of the chicken littles is, what do you do if you're a central government where you have to have foreign reserves? Do you all of a sudden double down on the euro? Do you double down in the yuan, which is basically a proxy for being for doubling down in the US dollar? What are you supposed to do? And I never get a good answer because on a relative basis, the US will still continue to do well. I think that debt to GDP is a red herring for a lot of people. And I think that the way that people run their personal lives, which should take income to debt into consideration, I don't think applies as much to governments. And I think these things are going to march forward as a group. There's not going to be a single G8 country that all of a sudden moves away and starts printing surpluses. It happened almost as an accident, an aberration during the Clinton administration. It'll never happen again. And I think that we shouldn't worry so much because I just don't see an alternative. So give me, instead of telling me how bad this is because you think about your own life and how it would be bad if you had debt to GDP of 100, I get it. As a country, give me the alternative country. But just start with that. Can you answer that question? What is the alternative country? Yeah, where would you put your, your wealth if not the dollar? Well, let me paint a scenario that's not as dire as a collapse of the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency. Okay, so on this Fitch rating, by ratings, the way, that's not that's not what I think happens, right? I I think yeah. this is just purchasing power goes down. That's it. But go ahead, Sachs. Relative to who? Be specific. Relative to anyone. But what does that what does that mean? Relative to anyone? Let me paint like a non-catastrophic scenario or non-apocalyptic scenario, which is what you saw in this Fitch ratings downgrade is that the bond market did move at the margins. There was a sell-off in the 10-year. And as a result, the 10-year bond yield moved up to 4.2%. So it wasn't a case of everybody shedding all of their U.S. treasuries. It's just that there were market actors at the margins who adjusted their portfolios. Okay, now, Freeberg is saying that the treasury is going to have to do another $2 trillion bond offering. And we have trillion-dollar-plus deficits as far as the eye can see. And we've got entitlement liabilities on the horizon and then a political unwillingness to do anything about it. So the deficits are only going to get bigger and bigger. Now, what does that do? It's supply and demand. When the U.S. Treasury needs to keep issuing more and more bonds, at some point, the demand for those things gets incrementally saturated and they have to offer a higher yield. So what happens? Well, the bond rates go up. And so the tenure goes up, like Freeberg was saying, from 4.2 to somewhere in the 5 to 7% range. And that doesn't mean that U.S. dollar is not the world's reserve currency. It just means that it gets incrementally harder and more expensive to keep financing our debt. Now, what is the result of that? Well, if I, as an investor, could theoretically get 7% from the U.S. Treasury as the risk-free rate, why would I want to take equity risk and put it in the stock market, which historically has yielded somewhere in the 5 to 7% range? So if I can get my 5 to 7% from a risk-free U.S. government bond, of course, I'm going to do that. So the discount rate on equities will go up. That means that the stock market relatively, on a relative basis, will go down. Risk capital will go down. There will R- be risk less capital risk capital. Will go down, and there'll be way less risk capital available for things like venture capital and private equity, just risk-taking of all kinds. And so the economy will just grow slower. It's not like there'll be a collapse. It'll just be this yeah. huge albatross. Yeah around the neck of the private sector. And this is called crowding out. We Here's the, I'll get, let me, may I give a counter here? I think if you look at the amount of sovereign wealth funds and the investment coming from around the world into US venture capital, that will keep the venture machine cranking here in America. But three charts to just look at here. Nick, pull up the first one, the 30-year Fed. So to counter this argument, really the aberration has been 2010 to 2020 when we had you know, low single digit mortgages, 3%, 4%. The majority of our lifetime, it was between five and 10. And if it's six up in the five to 10 basis, that's what we experienced for most of our life. And then the second chart, this is the lowest unemployment we've had in our lifetimes. If you look at the unemployment rate in the United States, 3.6 is unbelievable. And then combined with it, something we've talked about here for two years that we can't understand is when do all these jobs burn off? We peaked 
you know, during the post-COVID era at about 11 million job openings. And then, you know, we're still over nine. So for there's two or three job openings for every American who wants to work. And we've shut down the borders largely, even though we have some illegal immigration coming in. It is basically shut down the United States to immigration. It's about a third of what it was before Trump and Biden decided think, to shut I don't things think down. We're, I don't think we're looking at the same video that, that I'm seeing. Yeah, if you're looking at videos, those are very distracting. I would encourage you to look at the numbers of the actual migration into the country. It's a third of what it was. Have you seen what's um, happening in New York City? They got again, lines you're, around you're, the blocks. You're caught up of, in clips uh, on from the border. I would just look at the raw numbers, Sachs, and the raw numbers show. How do show they know the raw letting, numbers? Yeah, because we count them and we ca we count the well, they're, they're, you have to estimate them because they're illegal. But they got seven million. Again, in the last I would much two rather look years. at the numbers and the actual statistics than anecdotal videos because both sides will manipulate the heck out of them for their own purposes. But the fact is, America is just crushing it in terms of employment, and that's why we didn't have this crash landing. And the and I think the soft landing is because of employment. And I'll just end there. And if we can keep ourselves employed, and everybody from the Middle East to Japan to high net worth individuals in Europe are pouring their money into the US venture ecosystem. I think the setup here is we got to control spending, as you've said correctly, Freeberg, we get a little bit of control on spending, hopefully. And, and then we are going to have to slowly burn off some of this, you know, debt. Uh, we Chimot, can't live a little, with this kind of debt payments. Here's we a little data for you, some, you know. Chamath. This is from Congressional Research Service off of Fed data. So foreign holdings of US treasuries have declined from 40% to 30% of total treasuries. 70% of treasuries today are held by domestic investors. This is the data that was being described in the Treasury Advisory Committee, the Borrowing Advisory Committee uh, letter that I just said, is that they're seeing less demand from foreign buyers of treasuries. Now, I, I can argue, we can argue theoretically about what else are they gonna buy and what else are they doing with their money, I don't know. But the, the data is showing a decline in purchasing intention by foreign buyers of US treasuries and we're having to pick up the slack through investment funds held by the U.S., mostly pension, mostly retirement funds, uh, I would guess, that are buying these treasuries. That is not what this chart shows. This chart shows the effect of quantitative easing. That's what this chart shows. Because when you're buying treasuries from the market and retiring them, of course, the percentage of foreign and domestic holdings of publicly held debt is going to go down. So this last period, explain this X of QE. Explain it. Sorry, I don't understand what you're saying. This is a measurement of the amount of people that own treasuries. Is that right? Domestic versus foreign? Yeah. So who who owns? So as of December 22, there was um, 24 Domestic trillion. Hold, I'm, I'm going to assume because this chart is fucking worthless. If this if it doesn't assume that the domestic holding, the gray bar that adds up to 100 doesn't include the Fed, which it must. And that is because the Fed has been buying treasuries right, from on, the just, market. Okay, so just look, let me just give you the numbers for a second, and then we can it, it take out no, the No, 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 I'm, I'm just looking at the chart. The chart is a I, gray I, bar I, that says domestic holdings, I'm gonna and give then you there's the an orange bar that says foreign holdings. You've had 10 years of the, the Fed buying treasuries. I'm going to give you the numbers. There are $24 trillion of treasuries, publicly held treasuries outstanding. $7.4 trillion held in foreign hands. The foreign holding of publicly held debt between December of 18 and December 22 increased from 6.3 trillion to 7.4 trillion, while other investors increased from 16 trillion to probably 23 trillion. So, you know, it's we're having to pick up the slack. Investment funds, private investors are having to pick up the slack because of foreign demand for treasuries lagging at this point. That that's the point of the chart. I, I don't know what I don't know what to tell you. The, I think what this chart tells me is that the balance sheet of domestic holdings grows grows because the Fed has been buying treasuries. And in a in a world of QT, I suspect that this bar chart will change in the next 10 years. If you look at the histogram 10 years from now, if you assume that QT sticks around. So I don't know. You can interpret whatever you want to feed your anxiety. It doesn't change that there's a relative problem at hand which is you cannot sell one thing without buying another. That's just the way it works in financial markets oh, here, here, for these here's central the numbers. banks. The Federal Reserve, during that same time period, increased their treasury holdings. Here's the exact numbers. From 3.7 trillion to 9.7 trillion. So they bought 6 trillion of that debt. I think the fact that we're going to go from quantitative easing to quantitative tightening over the next decade is another but overhang. I, but, because but not, the, hold on a second, because not yeah. only does the U.S. government need to sell another 2 trillion of bonds every year to finance its deficit, which is basically the addition to the debt, you've got the Fed now shedding, what, like $8 trillion of bonds. Shedding. It already well, bought 
They're just no, well, they're they letting them to. roll off. They're letting them roll off and they're not reissuing 